Unisakoth presents my dream. Welcome. I have a dream, a dream that will never fail. My present situation notwithstanding, it's a mere passing cloud. Every mighty king was once a crime baby. Every great tree was once a tiny seed. Every tall building was once on paper, and so is my dream. This journey seems so long, yet I will not waver. The path has turned all over, but I will not give up. Things don't seem to work my way. I will never be in dismay, for there's this one thing I know. Every day of my life is a page of my history. Every step that I take is a move to my glorious destiny. And so I dream my dream. It's not where I am, but where I'm going that matters. My future has nothing to do with my past or present. The hard times I've had make me stronger and better. The inner courage within me doesn't draw. It just whispers. And so I dream my dream. Thank you. <laughs> you were amazing. That was great. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Lydia Polgreen. Um, Eunice, that was just remarkable. Thank you very much. Um, a terrific, um, terrific poem and very well performed. Um, so Eunice is here because of the work of two remarkable people who are sitting here with me. Uh, they're the co-founders of Shining Hope for Communities. And the amazing video we just saw, uh, it's, they, they run the school that was featured in the amazing video we just saw. Um, Kennedy Odede uh, grew up in a Nairobi slum called Kibera. And despite all the odds, he got himself to college in the United States. Um, and since then, he's devoted his life to creating opportunities for girls and their families in Nairobi. Um, and sitting beside him is Jessica Posner Odede, um, who as a junior at Wesleyan University traveled to Kibera because she'd heard about the work that Kennedy was doing there, um, doing some street theater to tackle sexual violence in the community in an innovative way. And of course, you know, Eunice, um, who's now in sixth grade and planning to become a doctor. Um, <laughs> hey! <laughs> So Eunice, why don't you tell us, how'd you come up with the poem? What was your inspiration? Um, I was inspired by the life in Kibera uh, because most of the kids in Kibera, most are raped. Some are neglected by their parents. Some are homeless. They don't have people to, uh, who can talk to them, whom they can express their feelings to. So I was inspired so much. And most of them have dreams, but they don't know how they can achieve their dreams. So I had to sit down and write a poem that, uh, that can inspire and uh, tell them uh, they have big dreams and they can achieve it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Kennedy, that probably sounds really familiar to you because you were once a little boy growing up in Kibera. Um, you had dreams, but weren't sure how to achieve them. Tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up in Kibera. What was it like? Okay, thank you so much. But I wanna be honest here, I was not nearer to Eunice at that age. So Eunice is really amazing, you know? <laughs> well, she's a girl and you're a boy. So that's an ever. <laughs> <laughs> But it was, a, it, it was a hard life growing up, and I saw a lot of challenges happening around the society. And I remember the Kibera that by then there were some spaces. I remember I was playing soccer, people used to love playing soccer. But I was not really happy to see the, the, the way women were being treated. And that is because of my connection to my mom. My mom and I are very, very close. 
So I was really sad to see what was happening to her. She was being abused, and I'm like, why? At the same time, I saw the struggle of women on the street. They are trying to sell food around, they are working hard, and yet they are not respected. So I wanted to, so I grew up with a very sad man. You know, I wanted to, to try to change things. So um, you, you did not have the opportunity, like Eunice, to go to school. How did you learn to read and write? So this is interesting. So at a very early age, I got very, very sad uh, because the role of the parents are uh, to provide the food and education, you know? And so my parents were poor. And I used to see other kids going to school with the bright uniforms. And I used to cry, Mom, when I go to school. But they couldn't afford. So what happened to me, I ran away from the house at the age of 10. So I started living by myself on the street with other street boys. So, but because I, had that, because I didn't have education, I think I was really, really looking forward for it. So I collect newspapers, anything on the street, to try to teach myself. Wow, um, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> Now, Jess, when you first came to Kibera, you were a, a junior at Wesley in your year abroad. What drew you to the place, and what did you find when you got there? Well, I had heard about Kennedy, this amazing community organizer who at 17 had saved 20 cents and bought a soccer ball and started bringing people together really with the belief that people could change their own realities. So I was just so inspired by that. So I convinced Kennedy to let me move in with him into the middle of Kibera. Um, and that was an experience that was, it was hard. I mean, the logistics were hard, going to the bathroom, taking a shower. But there was also just such tremendous resilience and such, um, such a drive of people to change their own lives. So I couldn't leave. In, in Kenya, you now see, uh, and, and in Mumbai and other cities, you see signs for slum tourism, go on this bus and see how poor people live, but don't worry, we'll give you the sanitized version. Kennedy, were you worried that, that, that Jess, before you knew her, was a kind of slum tourist? Yes, uh, no, uh, I thought she was a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a little bit crazy idea, and uh, like, you will not be able to survive, you know? And my neighbors used to come and knock the door every time to see if that white lady still alive, you know? <laughs> she's surviving or she's dead, you know? Was, yeah. Yeah. So I think it was a very, very uh, big step that Shajika did, yeah. Jess, how did that make you feel? I mean, you know, obviously you, people were living their lives. I mean, mm -hmm. did you want to be seen as special? I mean, I think I actually wanted to just see what life was really like and felt like it would be so easy to come in, volunteer with Kennedy's organization, and leave at the end of the day and go stay in a nice hotel or in a nice homestay, but that I would never break the boundaries that existed between us, and I knew I could always leave. And actually what struck me was that just how random the world was, and that I, by no choice of my own, had been born in Denver, Colorado. Kennedy, by no choice, was born in Kibera, but that together there was so much we could do. And so, I mean, it was interesting to have an audience every time I went to the bathroom or, you know, emerged in the morning, but it was also a really, I felt like I was really embraced by the community. Yeah. Um, now, Kennedy, you ended up, um, you ended up going to college in the United States. Um, tell me a little bit about how that happened. Okay, it was interesting. Uh, a very big move for my life. And I remember when I came to the States, one thing that I, I, I loved was, it was weird to see how much wealth around, you know, and how much people take things for granted. And I remember my first thing that I enjoyed most was the shower that I always remember. I took a shower for two hours. <laughs> Man, you know? And people thought I was crazy, you know. But uh, I was... I was really touched by the, what is going on. And at the same time, I feel a little bit sad of, I can't believe that there's a lot of food like this. You know, I used to go to college and I see people throwing away food. And I'm like, what? And at that time, I also felt I was dead. Because growing up, you know, people tell you, you die, there's heaven and there's hell. So I thought, oh my God, I think I'm in heaven. Mm. So I, I have to pinch myself to feel I'm feeling the pain and call my mom in Kenya to, to know if I'm really alive. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, based on that experience, why didn't you just try and stay in the U.S., um, live a comfortable life? Why, why go back to Kenya? You know what people don't understand is that I didn't, we, I, we didn't start shining off community because we were starting it. We passed through a lot of challenges in our life. I saw my friends being killed. I saw my sisters being abused. 
And I was an angry man. I was so mad with the society. I wanted to make it. When, you are, when you're a mad person, you are so angry, two things can happen. You can either become a bad person, or you can either use experience to be something good. So the struggle for me that we're doing in Kibera never ended because I came to the US. I even felt much more change to be happy in my community. So what I did in Kibera was I'm a movement leader. I like mobilizing people. So I did the same thing in college. I mobilized the students. And Jessica and I were able to go back again and build a school. Um, you started with this very simple of idea, right, of a soccer ball. You're, you played football I, as, a young, as, a, as a young boy. Your activism really began with that. How did, how did that soccer ball inspire you? The soccer ball is that uh, you start simple with what people love. Soccer ball became a way of engaging. People love soccer in my community to start talking about issues. And another thing that we did was, I was not really happy with the way women were being treated, to be honest. That was the something that was really moved me. And I found out that everybody loves their mom. They don't love women, but they love their mom. <laughs> and they love their sisters. So I said, guys, you know what, after playing soccer, do you really like the way your mom is being treated your sister's around? People are like, no, let's change it. By doing that, we are start, start working on women issues. Mm, right. Um, <laughs> so, why a school for girls? You were a, you were a, you grew up a little boy um, in poverty. Um, what, what, what drew you to educating girls as a way to express your activism? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's bigger than a school for girls. Uh, the idea there was that, so in my community, women were not going to school because of early marriages, you know what I mean? And uh, if we can have a very, very powerful school that can be, we wanna have the future women leaders coming from the slum, was a really, really big thing for me. And I wanted to, to change the status quo because these whereby women are not being really taken serious and having us, educating them, but at the same time empowering the entire community. So we have a school, at the same time, we also have what? Health clinic, we have water. So, and I also wanted to change what's called the mentality of people, to see the good in women. So right now, I tell you, in our community, people now view women differently, and even men are saying this. I want my daughter to be like Eunice. And that's a change of mind. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, Jess, when you first showed up in Kibera, you were an object of great curiosity. Um, um, but now that you're, you're there um, running the school um, and running the programs um, for Shining Hope, how, how are both you and, and the organization perceived? Um, how, how, how have you been received within the community? I think that, so when Kennedy first came, you know, we applied to colleges, he came to Wesleyan, and he really talked about this dream of building a girls' school. And so we went back, we built the school, and then we saw it was bigger than a girls' school, that it was healthcare, economic empowerment, gender violence services, clean water, all connected to a girls' school. And building that, it was actually, I felt like the whole community came together to build this. And so we have over 210 local staff members, we'll serve over 76,000 people. But more than that, it's truly, I, when Kennedy, Kennedy was at Wesleyan for three years, I was in Kibera, and so we temporarily switched continents. And to just see how people are so motivated to change their own lives, I think that the school and, the, and all of our services are really at the heart of the change that is happening in Kibera and beyond. Mm. Eunice, what is, what is the school meant for you? What do you like about it? What I like about this school is about the extracurriculum, which engages all the kids to have fun. Um, it also helps them to improve in their talents. For example, I love uh, journalism club, which enables me, uh, <laughs> which enables me to um, improve on my confidence, uh, talk in front of people. Um, Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, interact with people whom I don't know, and uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I mean, Kennedy, there, girl, as you've already said um, from your experience, girls are very vulnerable um, in in society in Kibera. Um, can you tell us about a couple of your students and the and the and the difficulties that they've faced? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many challenges and there's so many vulnerabilities. 
I mean, Eunice is a shining example of what a girl can do, and all of our girls can do that. And I think, I mean, we look at girls like Makesh, who her, her, she's living with her mom. Her mom doesn't have an income, and so she's forced to run a den brewing illegal brew. And there are men coming through. It's very dangerous at night. And so Makesh is subjected to things that no girl should be exposed to. And so we were able to start a boarding house, a safe house, for girls who at home are, are victims of ongoing violence and so that they can be in school and that they can absorb what's happening. Um, so I think there are so many challenges our girls face from not having enough food to uh, sexual violence to really just having so many challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. But what is so amazing is how they meet every one of those challenges. And if Makesh was standing here, you would just be blown away. I mean, Eunice aside, who clearly is a superstar and going to be Surgeon General at least and not President of Kenya in short order. Um, how, how are the girls in the school uh, generally faring academically? Our girls are doing so well. I mean, they read grades ahead of where their peers are reading in both U.S. and Kenyan schools. We took our first district exam and we were so amazed to be number one in our whole district. And we're one of the most... Thank you. We're one of the most affluent districts, and so I think all of our girls have big dreams, like Eunice, and that they're being given the skills and they're going to be able to meet and exceed all of those dreams. Beyond the school, how do you keep your organization um, financially viable and sustainable? Um, how are you supporting your work, um, and what are your plans for expansion? We're so lucky to be supported by so many people. So we have so many individuals who contribute to our work, um, both here in America and also in Kenya, also foundations, corporations, but we're always looking to raise awareness and support. And I think the vision is big that there are, Kibera is one slum, but Kenya, there are so many urban slums. Urbanization is one of the biggest issues that we face in our time. And so really taking this model of a girls' school connected to social services has the possibility to tr transform so many slums, like one that we just opened in this year, which maybe Kennedy will talk a bit about. Yeah, you, you've just expanded, Kennedy. What, what, how do you take this work, working with girls like Eunice, and make a broader social transformation? Because you can only, at a school, no matter how great it is, you can only teach a certain number of girls. How do you tackle the bigger questions, societal questions that Kenya faces? Uh, I, I don't want to be in trouble, but down my heart, I think if the world can have women leaders, I think the world can change. And by... <laughs> So I, and, and, and why do I say this? Let me be practical. I see this in my community. I see how much women really care about their children, and I see how much some of the men really just drinking around women, and I see how many women who are not educated are struggling hard. What about the educated? So for Kenya and Africa, if we have women like Eunice taking leadership in journalism eh, or in <laughs> any other aspect, I think that's how the way we're going to change our country. Because people in our leadership, they never understand what's poverty. So how do you want to help if you don't understand what's poverty? So I believe if we can have these leaders, our school is a leadership school, you know, who are going to change the bigger picture in the country. So I really have hope. And seeing you as our first student and being here today, I'm really just knowing that the future is bright. You heard it here first. Watch out for Eunice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.